Coming up on this week's show, we're coming to you live from the Coastal Magic Convention in Daytona, Florida. Plus, we've got an interview with author Zio Axelrod. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 229 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. A big thanks to Anne and Nancy for increasing their pledges. We'll have more information on how you can join the community at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. So we are at... Coastal Magic in Daytona, Florida, wrapping up the weekend. I've had a great time, and we'll talk more about it shortly. Before we get into all of that good stuff, let's start with a little news this week. We wanted to tell you about a Kickstarter campaign from friends of the podcast, Suzanne Brockman and Jason T. Gaffney. Of course, we've talked about their projects, Analysis, Paralysis, and Out of Body. And we mentioned a few episodes back that a new comedy project they're working on called Marriage of Inconvenience is going to be a series on the Deku streaming service. They are doing a Kickstarter for this now and to raise some of the money for the production. This thing sounds absolutely hilarious. So the little blurb they've got for this is new names, new jobs, new lives, new husbands. Two gay men entering a witness protection program find themselves married to help hide their identities from the dangerous people who want them dead. It's an odd couple for the 2020s. I mean, first of all, you've got marriage of convenience happening here despite the title of inconvenience, and then you've got people on the run, and it sounds like some tropey comedy goodness. So I can't wait for this series. If you want to check out the Kickstarter and some of the super groovy rewards that they've got, their campaign runs until Monday, March 16th, and we will have a link for you in the show notes to get there. Yeah. Sounds good. Some other TV we want to quickly mention that we have recently been watching and enjoying. The Thing About Harry, the TV movie that premiered the day after Valentine's Day on the Freeform Network. We watched that before we headed out here to Florida, and we absolutely loved it. It is a sort of enemies to friends to lovers story that sort of riffs on the themes, the familiar tropes and movies like When Harry Met Sally. In this particular case, the main character, Sam, has to do a cross-country road trip with someone he didn't like very much in the past, the hero of the title, a guy named Harry. And on that trip, they get to know each other better, and they become friends. And this movie sort of follows their rocky path of friendship through the years, sort of the ins and outs of their friendships and their lives as 20-somethings. It's a lot of fun. It's funny and it's heartfelt. I really, really enjoyed it. I absolutely adored it. I mean, it, it was the perfect constructed movie. The The way the two leads played off each other, Harry and Sam were so delightful as they went from prickliness into being friends again and then figuring out how to be lovers with their lives that didn't exactly mesh but then sort of kind of did peter page who wrote and directed and is responsible for freeform's good trouble and also you may remember him back in the day from the u.s version of queer as folk he did such a good job on this movie and then he cast it perfectly too Oh, definitely. The film stars Jake Borelli, who you might know from Grey's Anatomy. And it also stars Nico Taro as Harry. And this is his on-screen debut, as a matter of fact. If you'd like to know a little bit more about what went on behind the scenes of this particular movie, I highly recommend you check out the podcast Homophilia, where they had an extended interview with Peter Page. He was the writer, director, and producer. And they talked to him uh, about his career and what queer as folk meant to him and they also talk about how he landed this job of writing producing and directing (laughs) the thing about harry um and peter is wonderful and charming and very very funny uh as you would expect so i highly recommend you check out that episode of homophilia we will have a link in the show notes we'll also have a link in the show notes about where you can find the thing about harry streaming on freeform and if there's some other places that it's out there streaming now we'll link up to those as well 
Something else that we've been watching recently is the Riverdale spinoff Katie Keene. Now, if you've ever watched Riverdale and thought, you know, I would love this show, if only if it were less murdery, then <laughs> Katie Keene is the show for you. The show follows our lead heroine, Katie Keene, and some of her friends as they try and make it in the big city. It's sort of a charming and lighthearted new adult version of Sex in the City. It follows their various relationships and their attempts to make it in the various industries that they're trying to break into. Specifically, Katie is an aspiring designer, but she has to work for a Miranda Priestly type <laughs> character at a she-she department store. One of Katie's friends is, of course, Josie of Josie and the Pussycats fame, who has uh, made the move from Riverdale to New York City, and she's trying to break into the music biz. Also, there is their friend Jorge, who is trying to decide whether Broadway or life as a glamorous drag queen is his career of choice. Also, there's Pepper Smith, who is a well-to-do influencer, and unfortunately, most of her time is spent trying to hide the fact that she doesn't have a penny to her name. There have only been a few episodes so far, but the ones that we have seen have been really charming and funny and sweet. I love all of the characters and all of the actors. They're uh, really amazing. Yeah, this show made me so happy you paid attention to it and got it onto our list it wasn't something i was looking at because riverdale's too murdery <laughs> and so i wasn't really sure where the spinoff was gonna go but it's sweet i like these characters i like the people i like the sex in the city and the Miranda Priestly vibe a lot. I think if the Carrie Diaries had been more like this when it was on the CW, I would have liked that show a lot more. <laughs> it's totally delightful, and I'm all in on it at the moment because it's just a lot of fun to watch. So if you want to catch Katie Keene, it is on the CW. If you're missing the back episode, they will be on CW On Demand and on the CW app. Hi, I'm Jay from the LGBTQ romance review blog, Joyfully Jay. At Joyfully J, we review tons of LGBTQ romance, as well as romantic fiction and nonfiction. We review ebooks, audiobooks, and even the occasional movie. We typically review about 18 books a week, so Joyfully J is a great place to hear about new releases, catch up on books you may have missed, and find some new favorites. In addition to our reviews, each weekday we host an author as our first post of the day. This gives readers a chance to learn more about new releases get exclusive excerpts, find out about the author, and participate in great giveaways. Each author post on Joyfully J is exclusive, so you get access to book and author information you can't find other places. At Joyfully J, we love LGBTQ romance and are excited to share it with you. Stop by the blog at joyfullyj.com. You can also visit us on our Facebook group, The Joyful Jays. We'd love to have you join us. So we have been in Florida since Wednesday when we arrived for Coastal Magic. It has been another delightful reader weekend at the beach. Although I have to say for beachy weather, it has been kind of crappy because it has been gray and stormy until today when the sun finally decided to come back out, even though it's still a bit of a gale outside. But other than that, being inside with the readers has been super fun. Once again, Jennifer Morris has put together a wonderful program of panels. Somehow she just finds the right authors to put on the right panels to just make this a really fun time. I think both as an attendee and like for me as a moderator, I have really enjoyed what I've moderated this year. I started it off bright and early. I don't know what I did to Jen to get myself two panels that happened at 9 a.m., but I had amazing crowds for these panels, nonetheless. I got to do one called I Heart Conram, which was totally about contemporary romance, which, of course, it's really the primary jam for both of us on this show. We occasionally divert into other things, but it's primarily contemporary romance. I discovered that Avery Flynn is a hoot, and <laughs> I totally enjoyed hearing her stories. The crowd for this panel, I had to ask one primer question to get these authors to introduce themselves, and then the crowd took over from there. It was a wonderful discussion on contemporary romance, 
And despite the fact that this panel was totally populated by authors who write MF, I would love to read some of their books because I'm totally into some of the stuff that they described on this panel. It was awesome. You got started with your stuff doing comedy. And I think this is the second year you've done a comedy panel at Coastal. And I sat in on yours. You had hilarious people working with you, especially Alyssa Day, I thought. Just a hoot. Yeah, I, everyone is so so charming and so funny and so open and available to talk to all of the readers and all of the fans. I think that's what helps set Coastal Magic apart from every other reader event. And I, as everybody knows, I've also gotten really into romantic suspense. I have been to three romantic suspense or mystery panels over this weekend, and I've gotten to moderate a couple of them. I did one called Doing It by the Book. Megan Maslow has some amazing stories. She's led quite an amazing life because if you remember her interview a few weeks back as one of our Coastal Magic featured authors, she talked about some of the time that she had in Tanzania doing her cultural anthropology stuff. She learned far more than we realized in that interview around like even FBI labs that were being built in Tanzania at the time. It was utterly fascinating. I've also learned to never, ever, ever piss off Karen Rose because she will kill you in a book. And she also likes to put 12 dead bodies in her books at a minimum. So <laughs> I'm a little scared of her. One of my best finds here was in a panel called The Killing Game. Again, romantic suspense. I don't know how Cordelia Kingsbridge has flown under my radar with her Seven of Spades series that started back in 2017. In fact, Jay from Joyfully Jay, as I was talking to Cordelia afterwards, she's like, how do you not know these books? These books are awesome. And I totally see why. I now have a book that I will start reading to find out more about that series. But hearing how she goes about structuring her stuff, I was completely fascinated by that. We actually got to moderate a panel together called Publishing Plus. This one attracted me for us to do as soon as I saw it listed because it talks about what authors are doing with podcasts and web series and other ways to engage readers that are not quite the usual just having a Facebook group type of thing. And this had uh, an author who we've had on the show before, Gail Z. Martin, who also writes as Morgan Bryce, along with three other authors. We actually recorded this, and some of this will air uh, in a future episode of the Big Gay Author Podcast uh, because there was some really Im interesting information given out there that authors who were not here might be interested to hear. Another romantic suspense I did because I could not get enough of it featured Cordelia and also Victoria Sue who's also, of course, been on the show a few times talking to us about her different mysteries and some of the shifter stories that she does. The more I hear about how authors go about killing people, the more fascinated I am by what goes on in some of these people's heads, because it's really crazy how they will structure this stuff. I had two major fanboy moments, one of which you will hear in much larger detail when we get to the interview this week. But we also had a moment to meet Nancy Nagel. If you've listened to the show at all, especially over the holiday season, you know that we are major Hallmark movie fans and we'll watch them all year long, every single one of them. Nancy was here. Nancy's written a couple of books that have become Hallmark movies, including The Secret Ingredient, which I'm so happy now that I have a signed copy. She's also done the Christmas in Evergreen books that those movies were based on. And it was such a treat to get to talk to her for just a few minutes about you know how how these books have just become something that Hallmark Channel loves. They're picking up another one that will air this summer. She was such a delightful person. Uh, were you as gaga as I was to get to meet her for that brief moment? Yeah, Nancy is, of course, wonderful and charming, as were all of the authors that we got to talk to at the big signing on Saturday. Yeah, the signing was massive and there was a lot of people getting to meet and even more meet and greet the authors that they've already seen all weekend but now getting the opportunity to get the book signed it was another fabulous weekend at the beach coastal continues to be a great event that brings together a number of genres there were a number of 
MM authors here, folks that we have on the show a lot. It's mixed in with authors from other genres that, you know, it, there's such a diversity here and each panel has such a diversity. It's a treat and it's very relaxing. If you're used to going to Gay Romlet or something like that, this one has a much more chill vibe and you don't run around uh, and get exhausted. Uh, so it was a really good weekend and I'm glad we were back at Coastal and they were already talking about Coastal for February 2021. And so I'm sure we will have details on that as they get revealed in the coming months. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. Please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So I mentioned that I had two fanboy moments. The other one was getting to sit down with Zio Axelrod. A few weeks back, I got to review When Frankie Met Johnny and totally went gaga for that book. And right before we came down here, I mentioned at the end of last week's show, that she released the sequel to that book. And I started reading it on the plane here. It, again, makes me so very happy, and we got to sit down, talk about Frankie and Johnny, talked about her Alter Love series, and some other things she's got coming up. She is a total delight, and I think everybody's going to like this interview. Zio, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I've been really excited about this. And, and for taking a little time out of your Coastal Magic Weekend as well. <laughs> it's been great. What have you thought of Coastal so far? We're recording this on Friday afternoon, so it's the end of day one, yeah. essentially. Yeah. How's it been so far? It's been great. It's my first time coming down. I've heard a lot of great things about it. And so, you know, I was really curious and excited to come down. But I got here with last night, so I didn't get to see the first sort of evening of it. And so today was like, whoa, you're right in it. You know? But it was really cool, really cool. Awesome. I'm so excited that you're here. We met at RWA yeah, last summer. In New York, yeah. And your book, Frankie and Johnny, that you had on the table, it just grabbed my eye. Your cover for that is yeah. so just... Thank you. I can't explain <laughs> why, but the music and the guy on the cover, the whole thing was just like, I need to read that. Oh, cool. Excellent. It took a while, as it can happen with TBR stuff. Yeah, I can imagine your, your list. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I only read it a couple of uh, weeks ago, and it blew my mind. And oh. then on Monday, uh, this past week, you dropped Frankie and Johnny Let the Music Play, which is the sequel. Yeah. It was my birthday mer birthday surprise. I felt like it was a big surprise <laughs> just to be like, oh my God, the sequel's here. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Tell us about Frankie and Johnny, these two books, and about these characters that, frankly, I just fell madly in love with. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it was one of those things where sometimes you work on a book and you kind of have a character in your head or, or, or storyline or something. You're like, yeah, you tinker with it and you're like, okay, where's it going to be set and what's going to be the, the, the black moment, what's going to be the conflict or whatever. These two, Frankie actually just started talking to me one day. And it was because my laptop died. <laughs> of all things. <laughs> like literally my laptop died and I have, in my music, I use Mac for everything. So I don't write on the Mac. I, I'll do like formatting on it, but I don't write. So I couldn't do anything on my laptop. I sent it back to the manufacturer for fixing. And I was like, okay, well, what do I do? And so I was sitting in front of the Mac and I opened up the Word document or pages and just started typing and it was Frankie like speaking in first person which I don't really do and like he'll think, so he just sort of like landed in my head and he's probably the closest character to me that I've written in that his relationship to music is similar to mine so yeah he just and I was like well who would he fall in love with like who is he with now or what did he just what was his situation and you know and I sort of he told me his story and I thought, man, this is really cool. He's such an unusual character for me and what he does and his relationship with the people in his life and also his relationship with music and how music sort of dictates his life. You know, he builds his life around it. So, was, you know, that was the guy. And he just sort of said, write my book. And so <laughs> <laughs> I did. How did Johnny come into the equation? So I thought, you know, I was a college DJ and I used to work the late shift and I always loved it because even though we were a college station, you know, they were preparing you to be out in the real world. And so they gave you like, you know, a playlist or whatever, and you had to log everything. But on the late shift and the weekend shifts, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to do. And so I thought that would be the perfect world for Frankie. Like nobody's saying, here's the songs you're going to play. Here's the top 40 or whatever it is. It was whatever his extensive music knowledge 
you know, his program director was like, I want to use that. Let's just give you your own slot in this time that we're not worried about, you know, making revenue. This is your baby. And so it's his world. Like, the, nobody else is in the station at that time of night. Like, it's dark except for his booth. He can take off his shoes, put his feet up on the desk, whatever. <laughs> and so what would be the worst, like the nightmare for him would be for someone else that he doesn't know, a stranger coming into that space, you know. And so I was like, okay, well, we're going to have the station needs renovations as, as a station might. And when would be the best time to do that? When very few people are there. And when would that be? That would be during his shift. So here's this quiet guy who just shows up. And he's very nice and, and, and everything. He, there's nothing particularly unusual about him. He's just there and does his work. But for some reason, Frankie is intrigued by this person who doesn't try to chat with him all the time and who everyone else seems to like, you know. And he's like, well, maybe I need to get to know this guy. Maybe I've you know, been a little harsh on him because he's been invading my space and maybe I'll give him a, give him a break. And he's also super hot. So <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. So, yeah. The thing that struck me so much about the courtship here is that it again relies so much on music because mm -hmm. F Frankie wants to play Johnny the song of his mood for the night mm -hmm. and the, it's all and it's always Frankie's thing that you can't request the song you have to tell him your mood and he'll figure it out yeah now you've got a lot of singer songwriter family background in music mm -hmm. how did you structure those particular things to this is going to be the mood and this is going to be the song and weave that into the story in a way that the that the readers could all go mm -hmm, that that song I get it right it was interesting because you know we have to be wary of using music in the books we can't use the lyrics and things like that so I was like I'll mention something about the lyric or about the title or whatever but I figure titles are fair game you can use a title yeah. you can use a, but I you know when I wrote fan fiction <laughs> because I started out writing Buffy fan fiction, I would use entire songs in there, and you can do that, and you call them song fic, you know, and everything, but you can't do that when you're publishing a book. So I was like, well, how can I capture the mood of the song or the meaning behind that song? Um, there's a scene when, who does John say? There's, you might know better because I haven't read it in a while. But John says to him, he gives him a word, and, and Frankie's like stumped, and he's like, well, what the kind of mood is that? Like, I don't know what to play for that. And John's like, never mind, never mind. And he gives him another one. He's like, no, 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 no. You know, it's like a challenge for him, you know. But the songs, they just popped into my head, honestly. It was like, if, if I'm in this scene and this was the word that somebody gave me, this is the song that I would play. You know, I would play this Massive Attack song or I'd play this Fever Ray song or I'd play this, you know, whatever. But I, I have such an extensive catalog of music in my head at all times that it's not hard for me, you know. And I don't say that to sound like weird or arrogant or anything, but it's just like songs. I can just pluck them out of my head. And so I gave Frankie that gift. And I, I love that you did Spotify playlists. Yeah. Because yeah. I could go like, if I didn't know the song, it's here. And now yeah. I can just play that playlist yeah. when I want to hear. Yeah. And relive the music of the... Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is to share music with people. And I love sharing super obscure Norwegian bands or whatever with people. <laughs> when I was growing up, my dad, I grew up in the R&B soul world and I was a rock baby. <laughs> like I loved rock. So we would sit literally for an afternoon on a Saturday and I would play stuff for him. And he would go... Well, that bass line is from this band from 1955, and that guitar lick is from. The, and he would do that and sort of break it, like break it down. And so Frankie's thing is he loves to share music with his audience and, and with whoever he's with. And that was one of the things that he butted head was with his ex about, was that Garrett didn't really get the music thing. Like he's like, yeah, music is cool and everything, but why why are you so obsessed? Like why is this your thing? So to have Johnny respond to him in that way and see how wonderful a gift it is. It was like, oh my God, he gets me. You know what I mean? And and he's hot. You know what I mean? Like he's hot and he's, you know. So yeah, it was important for them to share that. I'm about 25% in now to the sequel. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just, I'm happy to be back in that world. And I can't wait to see these two get their HEA. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, there was a little hint at the end of the first book that there was at least a happy for now kind yeah. of lurking there. Yeah, because we weren't sure what John, what was going on with him. Yeah. Yeah, and at 25%, I'm still not totally sure what's going on. <laughs> Wait, I'm trying to remember, 25%, so where, where are you now? They've gone out to the big dinner. Like okay. where he took him, where he took Frankie to, to the really... Sampan, which is my favorite restaurant in Philly. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a, and it's a real place, It's a real too. place. And those edamame dumplings are ridiculous. <laughs> so if you're in Philadelphia, commercial, no. <laughs> 
And so I, they've just ended dinner. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Zio's sitting here going, uh-huh. I uh-huh. know exactly where you are mm, and okay. what you have yet to come. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What was it like getting back to the world? I was wild <laughs> because I knew, I knew the story. When I wrote the book on my Mac, I wrote, I think it was something like 35,000 words in three days. Wow. It just poured out, and it included some of book two. But when I decided to put that story into the anthology last year, it needed to be 20,000 words. And literally what I had done was cut it right there. <laughs> so it stopped at the end of, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it stopped, it stopped where book one stopped. It was 20,000 words almost exactly. And I was like, ooh, okay, that works, you know. But coming back to them, getting back into Frankie's head was a lot of fun because even though I'm in music all the time, he's not stuck, but he is a little bit obsessed with a certain period of time between like 1982 and like 1995. Like he pulls a lot of music from that era. And so going back into his playlist was a lot of fun, like pulling out the Massive Attack and pulling out, you know, Old Cure or pulling out whatever it was. And so it was really fun going back into his wheelhouse, Mm -hmm. you know. The, The piece of music that you've pulled out so far in the second book that was like, yeah, that it actually made me go put on the album. Yeah, was Prince's "Sign of the Times." Oh my gosh, yeah. I feel yeah. like that is like the most underrated of the Prince albums in that era. Yeah, there's going to be more. Like, obviously, I'm going to continue in that we're in this world, but it won't oh, be that centered is on such good news. <laughs> it won't be centered on these two. It'll be centered on Dyer. Oh, and Dyer's cool. Dyer's story. I can't even tell you what it's going to be about because it's a huge spoiler. And I dropped a little bit of hint in both of these books, but I don't think anybody got it. So I'm like, oh, they're going to be totally blindsided. It was just fun and scary at the same time. But he, his thing with Prince will come into play again, his right. relationship with, with, the, with Prince. But so you saw, you were in the radio station scene when, when they talk about Purple Rain? Or is that later? Am I spoiling it? <laughs> I could be spoiling it. I don't think I've okay, encountered so Purple Rain yet. I okay. think the first Prince that we've talked about in the book so far when he When he plays If I Were Your Girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, plays yeah. If I Was Your Girlfriend. yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering what he would pick. And initially, he was headed towards something I couldn't remember, which is why. I, I think it was to... Dorothy Parker, was it? That the sounds Battle of right. Dorothy Parker, yeah. And I actually had to go back to my copy and start playing it. Yeah. Just to, like, oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. And the people who are listening to us are like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the thing. And I said it in my review, so it shouldn't be that surprising. Like, mm. I, I, I wanted to be a music journalist. Right, yeah. And I kind of wanted to be a DJ. Yeah. And that is probably why I have a podcast now. And... So much of that book just clicked yeah. as things. And you really make everything around the music and the radio station almost becomes its own character. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really part of Frankie, but it's almost its own yeah. thing, too. Yeah, it's his found family as well mm. um, because he is an orphan here. He's, you know, he moves from Scotland and moves to Philadelphia, and he's by himself. Even the people that he moved in with initially in the house are gone. So he's kind of, you know, Dyer and Nikki and those guys are his family. I mean, he's, when he was dating Garrett, his friends became his friends, but they weren't really his friends, right. you know. So he really retreated into the music, and music is his, is his baby. And so he has these people that understand that they get it, too, on a different level. You know, that music is, Nikki is, runs the station because she loves music, Dyer is a DJ, so those are his people. You know, and now he has, now he has Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Why the Scottish? for him. Where did that come from? Because I get the Philly because you're from Philly. Yeah. I think that happened because I was working on another book and the characters were Scottish. And so (laughs) this is kind of embarrassing, but (laughs) his head popped into my head with a Scottish accent. And so when I was, when I finished the first draft, I guess it was, I had intention, I was going to uh, release it as a different book. And like all, everything that I had written was going to put it out. And so I started talking about it with friends and stuff. And a friend invited me to her Facebook group and said, you know, come in and talk about whatever book I had, had out and then talk about what you're working on now. And I was like, oh, cool. And she was like, and do a reading. And I was like, well, do I read from the book that's out or do I read from, because I was so in love with this story. And I was like, I'll read this. So I read it in Frankie's voice. And Kristen Higgins <laughs> 
tuned in, happened to like log on while I was doing it. And she tweeted and was like, oh my God, Zio is in this group reading this in this Scottish brogue and it's awesome. And I was and I like, I freaked out and I was like, oh my God, somebody is listening and tweeting about this. Like what? People are going to come and hear this and it's so awful. But I was so in love with Frankie at that time. But yeah, I don't know why Scott, and I guess it's just, you know, residual from the other book. <laughs> sure. And I was totally down with that too. Because I've had my Outlander phase, yeah, and so yeah, you know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm down with the Scottish guy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, and he's sort of. I wanted him. It was the the image of him. I wanted him to feel a little bit othered in his life. You know, growing up in Glasgow, looking like he does. There aren't a lot of people around there that look like that, and so there's a line in the first book where he says, "It takes a lot more effort to be different here." Like there, I was automatically different. Here, it takes a lot more effort, and I don't bother to make that effort. You know, which is one of my favorite lines in that book. It's one of the things that I really like about him too is that he's inhabited things in the U.S. so well, mm -hmm. and his and he didn't have that in his home country. Mm -hmm. It's more he feels way more at home here. It's another element of that found family, I think. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Especially Philadelphia and that area. He talks about it as if he grew up there. And he talks about the neighborhood, the neighboring areas, especially in book two, the drive up and down and where he likes to walk and, and all that stuff much more. You don't hear him talk about Glasgow that way. You know? No, you really don't. It's yeah. like, oh, I grew up over there. I grew there. up over there with those people, whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm here now. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned a little bit your, your massive music vocabulary and mm -hmm. everything. And we, we were tweeting uh, a few weeks back mm -hmm. and you revealed that your father actually is a co-writer on one of the spinners biggest songs yeah, yeah. I'll be around mm -hmm. you've been around music forever and yeah. you songwrite too mm -hmm. all of this creativity is so <laughs> is so awesome how is it two distinctive things for you to be a songwriter and a fiction writer or do they really um, come together more than people might think I think it depends on the writing style like for me I, I think I think I write somewhat lyrically, like melodically, the way the rhythm of my words will go. Uh, and I didn't notice that. Somebody pointed it out to me after like my second or third book, and they were like, I can tell that you were a songwriter or a poet or something because just the, the cadence of the words was a little bit different. You know, and I'll, I'll chop sentences up and do things and, and stuff that's completely grammatically incorrect, but it works in your, when you're, you know, the mouthfeel is great or it works well in your brain. You just have to um, train your editor to deal with it. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> you know, but it was funny. Like, I remember back, we're going back to the fan fiction thing. I remember one of the fic writers asked me to write poetry for her series. She was like, you know, you're a songwriter, write poetry. And I was like, I've never written poetry. She's like, you're a songwriter. You can write poetry. And I was like, oh, I didn't think of that. And it was the same thing with this. It was like... How do I go from writing songs, because fanfic was fanfic, you know, you're playing in someone else's sandbox, but how do I go from writing songs to writing long form fiction? And it was, that transition was easier than I thought it was going to be, mm -hmm. you know, just because I could translate that musicality to the cadence of the words, if that makes sense. I think so. It yeah. kind of clicks in my brain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when do we get Dyer's book? Do you have a, a rough projection on that? <sighs> I don't know. I, I want to get it out this year because I'm in, I'm in sort of a limbo right now with my publisher because I, I have a, a four book uh, series coming out with source books and I'm trying to figure out what that scheduling is going to be like and then I can get because I have like <laughs> I have like a queue of books lined up <laughs> that are coming out. The Alter Love series is in the wings and, and I think I told you earlier that Frankie and Johnny's second book was not supposed to come out this week. It was Later this month, the second book in the Alter Love series is going to come out. But you... <laughs> this is my it. fault if you're an Alter Love fan and we're like, where's that book? <laughs> yeah, sorry. But yeah, I thought, this is really cool. I'm just going to do this. So I you know, went back in and cleaned it up and hopefully didn't mess it up and <laughs> put it out. I have to get two of the Alter Love books out before June because I'm going to Oslo for an event there and, I, and they're big fans of that series. And so maybe after that, then I'll get to Dyer's. So it's like late summer, early fall, okay, something like that. Not, not that too far away. Not that far, yeah. So let's talk about Alter Love. That sure. was a nice segue you gave me right there <laughs> yeah. to, to turn that corner. Sure. Uh, tell me about that series. So in case you haven't figured this out, I'm a big fandom girl. <laughs> um, I've actually only ever been in two fandoms. One was Buffy this, and the one I'm in now is a TV show from Norway called Skam, uh, S-K-A-M if you're looking it up. And I totally fell in love with it. That's why I'm learning Norwegian or have been learning Norwegian. And I write fanfic in that world. And those readers, you know, they want more and more and more. And so I thought, oh, okay, you know, we'll take sort of 
the Norwegian aspect of this, and I'll see what I can do in a series. And, and again, here we are in music, twin brothers, Norwegian rock stars, you know, the first book, they're on the rise. They're just sort of starting out, and they're doing the college circuit, um, and they landed this University of Philadelphia, <laughs> made-up University of Philadelphia, where my one of the heroes is still a student. He's a grad student there, and, you know, they meet, and it's, it's like insta-love, which I don't like to write a lot of insta love but it's definitely like they connect right away and it's like burn hot and fast and then Jessen is pulled away by his duties to the rock to the band and stuff and they're going up and he sort of leaves Ian behind so you pick up in the book um, when he comes back to say hey I made the mistake and I'm here and let's figure this out kind of thing but, but yeah that whole series was inspired by my love of SCOM and Norway and Norwegian and all of that, and then the music stuff. <laughs> so. That is very cool, and it explains why. Before we hit the record button, she actually was learning a little bit of Norwegian before <laughs> yeah. we started, and now it all kind of, it all makes sense. Yeah, I have that, that app <laughs> on my phone that everyone has where you're learning a new language, but yeah. These, Alter Love and Frankie and Johnny, are mm-hmm. your first MM books. Mm-hmm. What brought you in to the MM universe after several books that were MF? Yeah, I I guess I've always read MM, or as in the fic world, they call it slash fiction, and just never read it in publishing. I just never read published books. I just, I don't know. I don't know why. And then, gosh, you would probably know better than I what year it was, maybe 2016, when him came out. Serena that sounds Bone. about right. And yeah. Such a good book. I'm such a Serena fan. Yeah, me too. And so when I was like, oh, she ran it, okay, I'll read it. And I absolutely loved the book and told everybody that I knew to buy it. And then at um, the Rita Awards, when they won, neither of them were there. And so I took a picture of the screen with their name on it and the Rita and everything, and I sent it to her. And she's like, oh, my God, thank you so much. And I just, you know, that was like my gateway drug was that particular book. And I had in my head... My very first book, which was MF, the Callum, was supposed, was initially going to be a series, and one the antagonist in that first book was going to get his own book, and it was going to be my first MM. And I said to my readers, like, oh, so how do you guys, you know, like, I, you know, I wasn't she never know, you know, never know if anybody's going to be weird and whatever. But they were like, yeah, that would be awesome. And so that was going to be it. And then I sort of, like, got away from that series completely. So when, when SCOM happened and this series, when Alter Love pop, popped into my head, I was like, ooh, here we go, okay, you know. And yeah, so that's how it started. And now I'm, I've been on this MM kick <laughs> for a while. Frankie and Johnny happened and, you know, so yeah, I love are it. You, are you kind of splitting between MF and MM now? Yeah, or? yeah. Although, you know, I have a, I've always had queer characters in my books, even Falling Stars has some and my series with source books will have some too so it's not like I'm getting away from Mm -hmm. the community completely it's just they want a very specific story you know so they get that and and I get to have my boys and (laughs) I'm happier that way because I have more freedom I can imagine writing Frankie and Johnny for a publisher because there's so much music in there and there's so much you know you know exposition and everything so I'm not sure that how they would feel about that so it's hard to say because i mean you stay away from the stuff that they would absolutely hate like you mentioned putting lyrics in it yeah yeah but there is a lot there yeah and going back to the music because we keep going back there did you worry about like setting it too much in a specific time frame or does it work i guess for Frankie and Johnny, at least, because that's Frankie's realm of music and Mm -hmm. do you have any of the same issues in ultra love of referencing things that people just may not know. Yeah, I, what I try to do when I write stuff that's in an industry that everyone knows about but but don't know about, you know, like mm-hmm. the behind the scenes stuff is I'll give them a glimpse inside behind you know behind the curtain and try to explain things and not not like a academic way, but just sort of like and this is through through plot or through conversation what's happening rather than saying and here's a thing that does the thing and thing the thing you know what I mean because that just gets boring it's like it becomes a manual at that point right so I just I try to give them contextual you know descriptions of what's going on or what you know when he's working in the console I can I try to keep it in a way that anybody could picture that console and doesn't mm-hmm. get too too technical you know or the station identification that has to happen in once an hour you know things like that mm-hmm. 
just to make it part of the conversation he's either having with John or in you know in his head or whatever it is. Like I almost missed the cue for the station I didn't. You know what I mean? Which like, totally cracked me up in the, <laughs> in the first part of, yeah. of of the new book because it's like that could have been automated, but that's not how he works. But that's not how he works. <laughs> and the fact that he does it so effortlessly, it's like breathing to him doing this, and that John throws him off, like he forgets to listen for the end of a song. He, he forgets. gets so flustered. He gets so, so flustered, you know what I mean? And he's like, I'm not like this. Why, why is this happening, you know? So. How did you find your way to romance writing? <laughs> so There's a story there I could tell by that laugh. <laughs> there's a story there. So I accidentally wrote a book. I was on the road. I used to tour in the UK and Portugal with my band. And I would get bored between shows or whatever. And so I started like just tinkering on my blog. And I think I wrote, I don't know, 500 words or a thousand words of this like what if situation between these two actors. And people were like, like the 30 followers I had on Tumblr were like, oh, I like that, write some more. And so I wrote some more, wrote some more. 200,000 words later and nine months later, I had this giant thing which became Falling Stars and Starlight. But they'd read it and it'd gone viral. Like people were talking about it on Twitter that I didn't know. And I remember going on Twitter one day and a friend of mine was like discussing the chapter that I had just posted with her friend. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And she was like, oh my gosh, this woman writes this thing and it comes out. And I was like, that's mine. And she didn't believe me. So I sent her the next chapter and she was like, oh my God. So I had no idea. And then I asked a friend of mine who was in this world, I was like, what should I what do I do with this? She was like, publish it. I'm like, but they just write it for free. Like, why would they want to pay for it? But she dragged me to the RWA conference and I had no, I knew nothing about anything, nothing. And she said, I'd never read a romance. And she was like, here are some titles that you can check out, you know, and they were all over the place. There was like a sweet beach read. There was some really high heat stuff, you know, everything in between. I think J.R. Ward was in there somewhere, you know, and I was like, I read like three of them. And I was like, oh my God, this is not what I thought. And then went, and that was sort of it. Went there and said, okay, maybe I can do this. That's amazing. I, so you hadn't even really read romance. I hadn't read before. romance. I was a sci-fi fantasy person. I was a huge Anne Rice fan mm -hmm. growing up. I read a lot of science fiction. And even now I read a lot of urban fantasy, like Jim Butcher and stuff like that. So, yeah, I was not a romance person. And then once, of course, I discovered it, I just read everything I could get my hands on. But, sure. like, yeah. But, yeah, I was definitely stumbling into it. <laughs> Were you writing fanfic before you wrote this long? I hadn't written thing, fanfic right? in like six years or something. Buffy, I don't know if you've ever watched Buffy, but oh, yeah. like, yeah, there's a lot. Spike was my favorite character. I was this Buffy. And I wrote a lot of fix it fic, where like I didn't like the way things happened <laughs> with Spike and Buffy, so I would fix that. And then after the series ended, I wrote a, so a couple of long pieces about what could have happened afterward that didn't happen. Like, things on the show didn't happen that way. This is how it should have gone, kind of thing. You know, but... I'd, even writing those things, and I think my longest piece was probably 60,000 words, but even having written that, I didn't think, oh, I could write a book. Do you know what I mean? Even though you'd written even though a I'd, book length. Even though I'd written book length. And it was, it's crazy to think about that now because there are so many authors that come out of fandom. Mm -hmm. You know, the Twilight fandom alone has birthed, I don't know how many authors. So, right. You know, so it's, it's weird for me to think in retrospect that, but that's how, that was my view. I was like, I don't write, I'm not a writer, I'm not an author. She's like, you just wrote 200,000 words. Like, what are you talking about? You know? And here you are. And here not I so am. Many years seven later, years later, yeah. With, not quite seven years yeah. later. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm. I've heard so many stories over the course of this show, and, and that's one that you just kind of stumbled into it because you were just writing. Yeah, yeah. Just writing that's, for fun, yeah. Is there another type of romance genre that you want to write in that you haven't done yet? I've written one hockey romance. <laughs> and I love hockey. It's one of my favorite sports. And it's MF, and I want to write more MF hockey, but I also want to write MM hockey, not not taking off a of Serena and all stuff, but I would love to write MM hockey. I think there's a lot of potential there for beautiful relationships. Yes, please. Please <laughs> yes, write that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and at, at one point, I tinker. I thought about writing a soccer Mm. romance mm -hmm. it was during the world cup and i was like i wonder if this is a thing you know because i like soccer as well but yeah i love i'm a sports person to watch not to perform <laughs> to watch the sports my husband plays like in a soccer league and you know like a beer league or whatever but yeah i'll just sit on the sidelines and watch <laughs> or write about it or yeah. both or both yeah. yeah 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 but yeah i think hockey is probably would probably be my next one after after i finish a couple of the the lines I have going now. I know what to ask you for now in 2021. So 
we've talked a little bit about more Frankie and Johnny, more ultra love. Mm-hmm. What else is on your horizon, whether it's MM or MF? Um, I have a book. I mean, I do. I write a lot of standalones within series. You know, like I don't like cliffhangers that much, even though Falling Stars and Starlight, when they were cut, it was a huge cliffhanger. I couldn't even call Falling Stars a romance because of the way it ended, <laughs> which I didn't know that either You know, at the time. But Camden, which was sort of my light romantic suspense book, has two other books planned for that so and there are people who are waiting patiently for those books so I have to get back to those as well Alter Love is my focus this year and I'll probably do another the sequel to Camden this year as well and then I'll finish up Frankie and Johnny's world that it's funny because like I I put it out as a duo now because there was no series name Mm -hmm. you know and now once Dyer's book comes out it's not gonna be Frankie and Johnny it's gonna be something else so I have to come up with like a different series name or something so I might do an omnibus of Frankie and Johnny and then make that part of the series you know yeah that makes sense and there's a character that I mentioned in there Simon who's he's the he's a DJ he is the one who's responsible for most of the revenue of oh, the station because okay. he's syndicated. Oh, right, right. Yeah. yeah, and he is a former music star who fell on hard times through his own doing, like partied too hard. And his, I'm spoiling this totally, so don't, don't listen if you don't want to be spoiled. But his band leaves him in his hotel room. They're sick of him, so they leave him in his hotel room. Oh, that's After harsh. a night of like, <laughs> whatever, they cut him out of the band. He gets written out of the band. They send him a check. They say, you'll get your royalties, and that's it. They're done. So he gets stranded in a hotel room in Philadelphia. And like, ref- and spends all his money like living in this hotel, and ends up a DJ at the at the same station that Frankie. He's got a story with that whole abandoned in the hotel. Room. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. can't think of a band breakup story that's gone quite that hard <laughs> yeah. off the top of my well, head. Well, he was yeah, he he earned it. <laughs> he earns it honestly. <laughs> he's he's a hard person to to like, even in his own book. I'll let you get through 2020. Yeah, with your 2020 plan. is pretty solid right now, especially with the the source book stuff. Those are big books. It's really in my wheelhouse. It's an all female rock band. The lead singer again is Norwegian, but the first book is not about her. It's about this woman who grew up loving music. She's incredibly talented. Her mother is semi famous, and so she hates her mother's desire. She would do anything to be famous, and so she grows up with this abhorrence for fame. And then ends up in a situation that could help her achieve her real dream with this band who's on the cusp of stardom. And she's like torn between like get doing this thing that could get her what she wants or just like going, no, 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 I can't deal with that. So, yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, it's it's set in that in my world It's right in my world. Nice. Yeah. (laughs) So much good stuff going on. What is the best way for everyone to keep up with you online so they know when all this is happening and coming out? Well, I'm a social media butterfly, so you can catch me everywhere. Zio Axelrod. Instagram is my, my main one. Twitter, of course. Um, Zioaxelrod.com. And if you're feeling really brave and want to know more about Scum, I'm on Tumblr under Zionin, X-I-O-N-I-N. But that's like only for the brave. <laughs> Because it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> we will link to all of those good things. Awesome. I will say from an Instagram standpoint that you never know when she may ask to uh, get your mood and have a little Frankie and Johnny moment. Yeah, there's going to be more of that. And uh, more of that. get your mood and send you a song. I got a great police song just a few days ago. Because he's obsessed with them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. He really is. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So thank you, Zio, so much sure. for spending some of your coastal magic time with us and oh, for, for such wonderful me. books. Really, really appreciate you having me. This week's interview transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And thanks again to Zio for taking some time out of her Coastal Magic Weekend to talk all things music and books and everything. And I cannot wait until she gets to that hockey series. I'm looking super forward to that. We have a little opposition I discovered over lunch today on what teams we root for, but I will read her hockey books no matter what. (laughs) Okay, guys, I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Now, coming up next in episode 230, we'll be talking to Frank Butterfield about his long-running Nick Williams mystery series. Frank actually lives right here in Daytona Beach, so we got to talk to him while we were here for Coastal this weekend. I loved hearing all things about Nick Williams. 
you've read those books, you love those books, and now I want to read them since we've talked to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really great interview, and I hope everyone will come back next week for that. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.